But today is a day that it is really, really good. I'm going to tell you that. Again, we have Chief Seabrooks with us. We have members of the police department here with us. And we also have all of you here. And we have a lofty aim. And the aim is to create partnership, to work together, to spread unity, and to spread positive thinking towards making our neighborhoods, our communities, our city, and the whole nation and the whole world a better place. That is our goal. That's why we have come together. So with that thought in mind, I am really honored here to formally introduce Chief Seabrooks to you and then invite her in a minute to join us here at, podium, at the podium. Chief Seabrooks is more than three decades of progressively responsible municipal uh, uh, policing experience. She has been a police chief for the last eight years. Chief Seabrooks' career in law enforcement includes sworn service with the California State Police Division, the Inglewood Police Department, and the Santa Monica Police Department. After rising to the ranks and uh, servicing in a variety of administrative and operational positions during, the, during her 25-year tenure with the Santa Monica Police Department, Chief Seabrooks was appointed to the chief executive position in the Inglewood Police Department, where she was both the first African-American woman to serve as a municipal police chief in the history of the state of California, and she was the first woman to hold the top executive position in that organization's 100-plus year history. In another first, Chief Seabrooks rejoined the Santa Monica Police Department as its 17th Chief of Police in May 2012. If I may take it, Uter, we're very grateful for that. <laughs> Over the course of her tenure as a Chief Executive, Chief Seabrooks has consistently provided effective reform and transformational leadership. As she implemented the tenets of 21 century policing, she has successfully navigated a variety of policing challenges, including an investigation by the U.S. Justice Department, organizational downsizing, organizational restructuring, team building, staff development, and succession planning, while also being attentive to fiscal conservatism, addressing crime trends, and the need to build and the strengthened community police, police partnerships. Basically what we're doing today. Chief Soaproks hold both a bachelor's degree and master's degree in public policy and administration from CSU, uh, Dominica's uh, Hills. Do I pronounce that right? I probably didn't do that, right? If I didn't do justice, please help me when you come back. And Long Beach, respectively. She's a graduate of FBI's National Academy, the FBI Law Enforcement Executive Development Seminar, PRF's Senior Management Institute for Police, and the Harvard Kennedy School's Senior Executives in State and Local Government. Friends, it is with great, great honor that I ask you please to join me, and if you may even rise, I would ask you please to do that. So we can be feelingly welcome Chief Seabrooks to the podium. Good afternoon. Um, I certainly appreciate your comments, and now I'm going to try that texting um, myself when it comes to the bio, because I always cringe when I hear all of that, because you're absolutely right. 
Um, but good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to attend today's event. Um, it's my honor and my privilege to share a few words with you this afternoon. Um, but before I begin, and on behalf of the men and women of the Santa Monica Police Department, I want to extend our sincere appreciation to Mr. Jamshid Ashran and the members of the Santa Monica Baha'i Center for creating this opportunity for us to gather and to speak on the topic of the significance of police community partnerships. But I also want to take a moment of reflection. Um, I want to acknowledge the various tragedies that have occurred across our nation, regrettable tragedies that have resulted in the loss of many lives, losses which should matter to us all because they represent so much, damaged progress, compromised trust, unfulfilled dreams, shattered hopes, and broken hearts. But even amidst the devastation left in the wake of these losses, we have to see that there's an opportunity for something different and something better. And something different and something better can begin here. Because here's where we can remodel, we can rebuild, we can promote progress, we can learn, we can grow, we can gain new or enhanced respect, we can foster a mutual understanding, and we can do better. So with that thought, let us reflect for a moment. Thank you. So, for what's been more than 35 years of my life, and certainly all of my adult life, I've been a police officer. Um, over the course of that time, I've witnessed and experienced and have been able to be a localized catalyst for a lot of the changes that are now occurring in my profession. In terms of your police department, though, here in Santa Monica, the changes that are affecting the profession have made us better because we're not new to the game of these, these changes. And we're better in terms of our diversity, the increased levels of our personnel's education, the strengthened requirements associated with those whom we hire and whom we promote, the array of contemporary topics that we teach and revisit with our personnel, topics such as mental health, social justice, implicit bias, and procedural justice. We're better because of our atten attentiveness to the implementation of strong policies which de define the array of desired behaviors as well as those behaviors that are not desired. We're better because of the presence of a procedurally just disciplinary system, state-of-the-art equipment that we provide to our personnel, our focus on well-being, and our more contemporary responses to crime, and certainly our commitment to community engagement and appropriate transparency. And we're better because for a long time now we've approached our work in a manner which is consistent with the recommendations contained in President Obama's 21st Century Report on Policing. But before you think this is just me standing here and shamelessly touting all of the, the wonderful things that are inherent in the Santa Monica Police Department, let me say this and let me say it unequivocally. I'm quite proud of the heroes who go about their work every day doing what it takes to keep this community safe. But I also have to tell you that I'm clear that our better is not our best and we're not content to rest on our laurels. As our vision statement says, we strive to be the benchmark for excellence in the profession. And that means that in striving to be the best, we're pushing up our sleeves and putting in the work necessary to turn what is better into, our be into what's best for you, our community. And we do that because we've understood always that our core mission is to prevent crime and social disorder. But because we're an imperfect group of people performing under often difficult circumstances, we've at times missed the mark. And where we've stumbled as a profession has been in terms of our ability to consistently carry out our mission in a way that's bias-free, that's respectful, that's courteous, or in an otherwise manner, in, in a manner otherwise that would tell you that what we're doing is appropriately professional. But believe me, we do understand the true cost of those missteps. And accordingly, as it should be, our mindset and our approach to our work is different. In Santa Monica Police Department, we understand and we embrace the need for a continuous evolution in our approach to our work. And I'll also tell you that that evolution is far from over. We're a contemporary police department, and as such, we understand and embrace the fact that one of our most valuable tools is the respect of the community we serve. We understand that to secure and maintain your respect, though, you have to voice an approval of what we do and how we do it. And trust me, we get that, too, because we're performing in a relatively sophisticated environment, we have to work smarter 
The changing environment of the work and the dynamics of this community's environment demand a thoughtful and more intelligent approach. But you have to know that even here in Santa Monica, the police department is increasingly relied upon to handle the manifestations of unaddressed or underaddressed societal issues, issues such as homelessness and mental health. Our most significant adjustment to our work resulted when we acknowledged that this community expects us to be so much more than just enforcers of the law or crime fighters. We're increasingly expected to be counselors, social workers, mentors, teachers, therapists, resource guides, and the people you call to find your lost pet or to report that your neighbor's just using too much water. We're expected to respond with cat-like agility to the changes brought about by evolving technology, and we're expected to solve every crime, no matter how complicated, in 60 minutes or less, just like they do on CSI or on Law and Order. But no matter the reasonableness, your expectations required that we looked at ourselves and that we work quite differently. And we responded. You'll often hear of our obligations, you'll often hear us speak of our obligations to be peace officers, to be guardians. On the other hand, we hope that you clearly understand that there's going to be those occasions where in less than a moment's notice, we'll be called on to act as compassionate warriors as we address the more substantial threats to our collective safety. And despite the commentary of those who would have you believe otherwise, the vast majority of my colleagues here in Santa Monica and in the, professional, in the profession generally, we enjoy our roles as guardians of our community. We readily embrace our obligation to give our full-time attention to those duties that support the reality that the father of modern law enforcement, Sir Robert Peel, envisioned in 1829 when he said, the basic mission for the police to exist is to prevent crime and disorder as an alternative to the repression of crime and disorder by military forces a mission which is done by the ready exercise of courtesy and friendly good humor, by the ready offering of individual service and friendship to all members of the community without regard to their race or social standing, by the ready offering of individual sacrifice in the protecting and preserving of life, and by maintaining a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police. And this last statement, by maintaining a relationship that gives reality to the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police, is the essence of something that we intuitively know is not new, but we treat it as though it were. And that something goes by a variety of names, constitutional-based policing, relationship-based policing, values-based policing, neighborhood-centered policing, or just plain community policing. But at its core, no matter what you call it, the philosophy involves working in partnership and in collaboration with the community to ensure that the community's members have a seat at the table and their voices can be heard and there can be a place for them in shaping the delivery of public safety services. Community policing also requires that the parties are mutually respectful, cooperative, and collaborative as they seek to understand the dynamics involved in achieving procedurally just public safety services for the entirety of a community. So when I see the work that police, today's police officers accomplish, particularly in this community, I know they believe, as I do, in the strength and the truth and the possibilities inherent in Sir Robert Peel's principles. I also know that the officers in this community believe in the value of a policing philosophy which embraces procedural justice and the collaborative community partnerships. In short, I know that they believe in community policing. Now, as a police leader, I see Robert Peel's 187-year-old assessment of law enforcement a bit differently than I did when I was first introduced to it as a college student and as a fledgling police officer who was learning about the history of my chosen profession. Like the majority of those who chose and who choose to serve in this line of work, I understand that these principles don't exist in a vacuum. Much like those contained in the various seminal documents that govern this country's operation, like the U.S. Constitution, or that govern our, professions, uh, our profession, like the Code of Ethics, the Police Department's uh, mission, vision, and value statements. These principles are meant to provide a framework for how our work is conducted. But these principles by themselves aren't sufficient. These guiding principles are operating framework. They need a bit more to come to life. They need the strength of everyday words like community, unity, communication, 
commitment, and partnership. Quite often, pundits throw these words around, but I question whether they truly understand the importance of these words, both in terms of the individual strength of each word or in terms of the collective impact these words can have, particularly when you're talking about them in a policing context. When I was a kid, I was fascinated by words, by their origins and what they would mean. I was intrigued with how words were used and how the meaning of the words changed, depending on the time, the context, or the speaker's intent. Yeah, I was kind of that kid, uh, the one who thought spelling bees were cool, who listened to talk radio, and who would occasionally surprise or shock an adult with something that would come out of my mouth. And while that fascination has continued, I tend to look at words a lot more thoughtfully now, more critically, certainly. It's not just the words themselves. There's so many other things, context, nuance, the message, the overt message, the underlying message. And sometimes in my more peaceful moments, and when I do get them, I t tend to enjoy the process of letting my mind wander about a variety of things. And when I do this, I find myself thinking about random thoughts, some of which have a direct connection to my work and some which have no connection at all. But here's what happened earlier this week while I was thinking about today and, and, and what I wanted to share during our conversation on the importance of community police partnerships. Like many of you, I suspect, um, I was listening to the various political speeches and the political analysis and commentary, and I found myself thinking about the words being used, certainly what was being said and what was being, versus what was meant. Um, and while I was musing about these things and their implications, particularly given the significance of the conventions, the tragedies of Dallas and Baton Rouge, and the extensive commentary about race and law enforcement, it occurred to me that with a level of regularity, I was hearing the words community, communication, commitment, partnership, and the police quite a bit. And it didn't matter what television channel I was listening to or watching, um, I saw diversity in the various people who were talking. And that's when I was struck by the impact of the word community. Whether I was watching the local English channel, the Spanish channel, the Japanese channel, or Korean television channel, the word was the same, and it jumped out. And I realized that it wasn't a coincidence that in a variety of languages, the word community is the same, and it's, or it sounds the same, and it generally means the same thing. In Latin, for those of you who are familiar with Latin, it's comunitas. In Spanish, it's comunidad. In French, it's communité. In Japanese, it's community. And in Korean, it's community. I also thought that it's not an ironic coincidence that the word community ends with the word unity. And we know that that's a state of being one or being whole. And if you look at it a little bit differently, it's a combining of seemingly different people or things in a way that makes them seem to belong together as one. Got all that from a straightforward word, community. A word we understand to mean a collection of people who, while different, are unified in their similarities. And then I began to think I might be on to something, and so my mind didn't stop there. And other words started to come to mind. And before long, I'd moved on from the word communi community to the word communication. And I thought about how communication sounds so much like community, but it's so different. A community is that space where a collective of people who are unified in their similarities come together to coexist to share or exchange information. To share or exchange information. Hmm, communicate. And this communication serves to bring about a mutual understanding and a respect for the differences inherent in the people who make up the community. But how does that work? Uh, how does communication shift from the sometimes confusing, uncivil noise caused by the competition of a multitude of voices? How do we get to a more civil, thoughtful, deliberative, thought-provoking, and orderly dialogue? How do we cut through the noise? And we know there's a whole lot of it. How do we get heard? How do we ensure meaningful acts follow from what we need to hear? How do we know who and what to listen to? Importantly, is there ever a time when we need to stop listening? And if so, how do we know when we've reached that time? And how do we make sense of it all? Well, it's pretty simple. We communicate. We talk. We actively listen. We seek to understand. And when we get frustrated, we pause, we catch our breath, and we reframe the question. We do this because we have to do better at understanding somebody else's perspective. We have to practice empathy. And while we may not agree, we have to become comfortable with the idea that disagreement is not zero sum. It doesn't mean that the discussion stops, we throw our lollipops in the dirt and go storming off and going home. 
It also doesn't mean or justify being disagreeable, disingenuous, or downright dishonest. It means we have to understand that communication is vital. It's a means of extending an olive branch for enabling the building of bridges, which in turn enable people of different races, different cultures, different colors, different identities, different beliefs, different experiences, and different economic positions to cross the individual divide that in the absence of communication certainly separates us. Communication enables us to break the ties that bind. It enables us to respect the unique differences that exist among us. And it made me think of something that I heard one of, actually I read one of my colleagues uh, wrote in his blog. Communication is our armor. It's a tool that lets us make sense of the powerlessness that we sometimes feel when we're overwhelmed and are facing a seemingly endless barrage of catastrophes. Communication, when used properly, has the potential to bring understanding and healing. It's a means of releasing the wrenching tensions and emotions that we feel. Effective communication can be cathartic for individuals and communities, particularly when the goal is to build or enhance the process of mutual understanding and respect as part of achieving larger goals. So I continued my journey of free form word associations, and I thought about the next word that flowed from this unspoken stream of consciousness. And that next word that came to mind was commitment. With thoughts of commitment came associations with words like fidelity, loyalty, dedication. And of course, commitment made me think of relationships. And I thought of that intangible but no less binding exchange between two people, or more, and by extension, by the word community. I thought of the word community, and that thought took me back to my high school government classes when we talked about, for hours and hours and seemingly hours on end, we talked about democracy and the social contract. And for those of you who may remember, and for those of you who may not want to remember, but, and for those of you who need a refresher, the social contract is that unspoken agreement that defines and limits the rights, duties, and responsibilities of the members of the community. And then my thoughts of community members and the social contract gave way to thoughts about partnerships, um, those relationships that usually involve close cooperation and collaboration between parties having specified joint individual duties, rights, and responsibilities. And this is where my work came sharply into focus, because as the chief executive of a police department in this community, one of my responsibilities is to ensure that the men and women of the police department in Santa Monica focus their collective efforts on developing and nurturing the ever-important relationships and partnerships that must exist between a police department and its community if there's to be mutual respect, understanding, and appreciation. So we often hear about the theory that there are six degrees of separation or six links in the chain which connect all people, places, and things. Well, I'm not sure whether there's any real truth to that theory or not. I have seen it at work in other ways. Earlier, when I started thinking about what I'd say this afternoon, the free association process started with my thoughts about the importance of strong police community partnerships. Those thoughts morphed into various thoughts about the meaning of community, its logical connection to unity, the importance of communication in building bridges, extending olive branches, and acknowledging that the events that create shared pain within a community need to be spoken of, because doing so enhances mutual respect and understanding. Our collective commitment to the social contract, which requires trust-based collaborative partnerships between the community and the police force, is there if there's to be an overall benefit to everyone. And so these concepts of community, unity, communication, mutual respect and understanding, commitment, and partnerships. All of these represent not the six degrees of separation, but alternatively, the six degrees of connection. Connection to our collective obligation to work together to seek better outcomes. The time to repair trust, to come together collectively as a community, to break down the barriers to progress within our community is right now. And what better place than right here, and what better time than right now is there to build to work, to come together, to commit to building a stronger community through the strengthening of the alliance between people and the police. The first line of one of this country's most seminal documents begins, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. So as a fitting close to my comments this morning, I'm going to just ask you to repeat this with me. We the people, we the people. in order to form more perfect unity, within our community. Now we know what to do. We just have to do it.
So now this is where you get to grill me with questions. But thank you. We are grateful to you. Thank you. That's Welcome. such a wonderful uh, talk and presentation. Uh, Chief Sriworks is going to take some questions and respond to your, you know, questions. Who wants to stop? Or as I say in the briefing, crickets. That was so beautifully stated, that classic example about communication and the necessity of communication and all that you said was so beautifully stated. And I was trying to think, I was taking down so many notes, but I was trying to think the ultimate or classic breakdown of communication comes in that moment when a police officer and a civilian, say, have are in the same place at the same time and there's no time for communication or someone thinks that communication is not necessary or, be, or helpful. How does a police, police officer bring in the concept, the all important concept of communication in that instant and where do you see the breakdown or possibility of communication in that instant when there is a well, let's say a civilian and a policeman are at the same place at the same time and one of them is doing something wrong. Well, that's really a hard question to answer because communication implies to some degree that there's, that there's time. Um, so in that circumstance when, you know, the officer says stop, then the action is to stop. Uh, and if the officer is giving directions, put your hands up, you know, don't move, that's not the time to engage. The time is when, when there are cooler heads prevailing because, you know, the question becomes, why is this officer making this contact? Generally speaking, you know, in most circumstances, and there will be those times when sometimes it doesn't go this way, but in, in a lot of circumstances, the officer will make, it, make an, a contact, make an approach. I'm Officer So-and-So of the XYZ Police Department. In my case, I'm Officer Seabrooks from Santa Monica Police Department. I'd like to have your driver's license, registration, proof of insurance. Or, alternatively, I am here investigating A, B, and C, and I need to talk to you. Um, at that point, the question can be, well, you know, why do you need to talk to me? Well, I'm going to tell you, but if I've asked for documents, I'd like to see those first because you can see who I'm talking to very easily. My name's on my chest. I need to know who you are. And, that, and that, there's that conversation. Now, on another front, though, the conversation can, can go very differently. Um, maybe what the officer is in, engaging in is a direct investigation of a violent crime. And the person that they encounter meets a description of a suspect associated with that violent crime. Then there may be a more definitive level of direction given that doesn't give the sense that there's an expectation that there's going to be bi-directional communication at that point. That What I'm saying is the officer is going to tell someone to do something and the expectation is going to be that that gets done and the time for talking comes afterwards. So we have to understand the dynamics that the officers are dealing with. And you know if it's you on the, on the, the side that's being stopped or being talked to, you know what you've done. But the officer doesn't. And so cooperation is also one of the, the key components of an effective communication. Um, and, and quite frankly, it doesn't always go that smoothly, but on the other hand, it doesn't always go that badly either. So I don't know that I can answer your question in that, that very easy way that goes one, two, three, ABC. It all depends. If it's a generalized circumstance, a, a more routine, and I would say there's no such thing as a routine thing for the police, but if it's a more routine uh, activity, there's one level of conversation. If it's another set, there's another set of circumstances. And you'll know because the, the red lights will be on, the, the officers will be giving commands possibly over a PA or they're yelling, or quite frankly, they're giving commands and directions at gunpoint. And that usually does not evoke the ability to have that meaningful two-directional conversation at that time. Could you address how all these events that have happened in the last year tactically affect your department? It seems like sometimes in some of these events, like Ferguson, this is my own personal opinion, I read the transcripts of what took place with the officer. 
it seemed like he approached this guy too fast, too close, rolling down a window, and so some of it was tactics. Mm -hmm. That's my question. Yes. Um, the contemporary police department, which we are, we evaluate the things that occur uh, in other places, uh, near and far, and particularly when they're large, like the circumstances that occurred in Ferguson, certainly like the circumstances that occurred in, in Baltimore. Um, and, and we look at those things to see what are the learning points, because one of the measures is to look at these things and, and find out, well, if we are ever faced with circumstances like that, how can we go about uh, getting a different outcome? So yes, in, in that circumstance, there were some tactical issues with the officer. Uh, part of that, though, comes in the mind that when he initially saw the two folks walking down the middle of the street, he didn't have the information about the robbery that had occurred. And police, we know it was a robbery. Looking at the video, some folks said it was a theft. But when you think about how the store clerk was treated, that's what transitions it to a robbery, a circumstance which uh, changes the tactics that the officers, the officers should have used. But there's always this delay in information. Um, he's driving down the street, sees this, these two individuals, drives up next to them, which is tactically unsound, um, even for a minor encounter like that, uh, and at a point drove past them um, and then came back, and then either they, came, they either caught up or he, turned, he backed up to them. I'm not quite clear about that. Um, but unfortunately, the change in information that he received caused him to have another reaction. And that's where the tactics really become at issue. So we look at that and we talk with our troops consistently about the tactics that they use. Um, fast forwarding to Baltimore, um, the placement of, uh, of Mr. Gray in a vehicle uh, where he's not restrained and things like that caused us to look at our equipment and realize that we needed to make some changes, pull some equipment out of, out of uh, service that would potentially under the same set of circumstances where you have someone who's not cooperative in the sense that they're resisting uh, having been restrained, and, you can st and contrary to popular opinion, you can still do harm in certain types of restraints and handcuffs, um, because we've seen some stories recently where you know, police officers were killed by handcuffed suspects. Um, they were shot to death. Um, so we want to be thoughtful about, do you put someone in a position where you put them in, in, in an unrestrained vehicle where they're moving around at the whim of the braking or acceleration of that car? And the answer is no. So we, had to, we looked at that and we realized that we have equipment that could similarly position us. And we pulled it out of service to order something new that allows us to restrain folks. So we look at the less, we use the, the, the circumstances in other communities as abject lessons so that we can do better at each phase. Because there's no growth if you repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. Um, and I think they call that something like insanity, if I'm not mistaken. So we, we want to do better. Um, you know, and, and where we have the circumstances, I'm sure that cities and departments look at what we do. Um, we had the incident back on June 7th in 2013, and we took our lessons learned on the road and shared them up and down the state uh, with other police agencies so that they could grow and learn from the things that we did. So there's a debrief that goes with these kinds of events. Um, we had officers last week at the DNC so that we could see what the police department was doing so that we could understand that if we ever have these large-scale events, and we do have large-scale events, on every Thursday night at the concert, there's 40,000 people down at the beach. And we need to understand how to be able to address the, the potentialities that can come from that. So thank you for that. Did you see the first hand in the back? Uh, there's like three or four back there. Thank you. Thank you so much for your speech earlier. Um, my name is Sonia, and I'm a doctor specializing in psychiatry, and think often about the similarities actually between the role of mental health professionals and the, and the police in kind of bridging a gap between objective values and then the practical operation of things. Um, two weeks ago, the week that Alton Sterling and Philando Castile were killed, I was driving past a group of cops here in Santa Monica who were holding a man down who was bleeding. Um, and as a physician, I stopped to see if there was anything I could do to help. 
one of the police officers who was there was getting really frustrated with people who were filming this interaction. He was like, they're incredibly irresponsible, they shouldn't be doing this. And I said to this police officer, with all due respect, sir, I ask that you not take this personally, that you recognize that our country is in pain and that these individuals are trying to look out for the best interest of someone after these two killings. Now this cop said to me, oh, you're talking about the two men who, killed this, who were killed this week. Well, they were sinners. And we all know that only 140,000 will make it, referring to the Bible. And this was a really powerful interaction for me because it really underlined the fact that there is a gap, similar in medicine, similar in the police department, between the values that we discuss and the internal values that actually operationalize those practices. So this man clearly thought he was keeping his community safe, but it was evident that that meant policing people of color so as to protect white people in Santa Monica. That was how that was practicing and function. So my question to you with this huge challenge is how do you work with your police department to really delve into the nuances of how those broader values are practiced and the internal values that people hold when it comes to whose lives matter, who needs to be protected, who should be feared, and who ultimately deserves you know, oppression or being stopped, who's, who's seen as suspicious. How is that um, training put into practice? Well, let's start with people don't deserve to be oppressed. This is a democracy. Um, but what we do have to ensure is that community standards and community values and what's important in this community, I can't speak for what's outside of the boundaries of this 8.2 square miles, um, this community has a say in what it deems to be important and what is problematic. Now, we have a set of values in our organization um, that we look to as a measure be uh, for behavior. Is our behavior representing the appropriate integrity? Are we being appropriately respectful? Those kinds of things. Now, you talk about issues of competing values, you know, and, and how does one operationalize that? I think what, what we can't lose sight of is I can stand here and I can tell you that 99 times out of 100, X is true. And there will be those of you who will say, but I saw Y. And, I, and I'll have to say yes, and that, that's true. Um, but what's important here and what can't be lost sight of is what I said earlier. We're an imperfect pe uh, group of people doing a very difficult job under very difficult circumstances. And we won't always get it right. But what we do in Santa Monica is we practice constitutional policing. Um, we are, our doors are open if you're dissatisfied or you see something that you feel is, is inappropriate. And what you said to me when you made the comment about someone saying somebody's a sinner, that's not a value judgment that's appropriate for us to make. The, the judgment that's appropriate for us to make is, is what we are addressing. Is that something that compromises the safety of the community, no matter the color of any of the parties? Now, if someone calls us and says, the party who is, for the sake of discussion, having a, a psychiatric episode or mental health crisis on the corner of X and Y looks like this, and gives us a description that includes race, then we would be remiss if we went and stopped everybody but the person who looks like that. So we're going to do that. Now, what I would hope is that we are compassionate in our approach, that we're thoughtful, that we utilize all of the techniques that are, and, and, and tools that are appropriate for that situation. No more, no less. And then if we don't get it right, all of those people who are standing there with their cameras will let us know so that then we can leverage our internal policing mechanism to address that issue either from the standpoint of the employee needs to be trained or some other corrective mechanism needs to be employed. And that's how we hope that works. I also would hope that you know while folks are out there with their cameras, um, because this is nothing new to the Santa Monica Police Department. When I was a police officer back in 1981, people filmed what I was doing. The only difference was the, the, thing, the, the device they used was a lot bigger than something they held in their hand. So it's nothing new. And we're a tourist community. People have taken pictures of us doing the things that we do all the time. So what I would suggest is, you know, take a look at that, though, and make sure the officer isn't by him or herself needing help while you're busy trying to capture the image.
offer the assistance. Um, so it's a difficult question. I think it deserves more time than I can give. But I hope that what you take away from this is we police to the degree that imperfect people can police without bias and without prejudice. We base information on the information, we base our actions on the information we receive and that we perceive. Uh, if there's challenges, there's a, a mechanism to, for us to address that, and we want to be told about that so we can address it because we're very proactive in that regard. Yes, sir. Oh, no. Oh, he's, he's got it. Yes, ma'am, in the blue? Ah, uh, in the dark blue first. <laughs> or darker blue. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know how you, with all the negativity and around, how you keep your force positive when they get out there every day and have to deal with everything that's going on. You know, they have to have that great attitude because that's what you expect. And so how do you do that? Well, we try to create a, a motivating environment. You know, I always say... Our job is to do the things that society has determined that it doesn't want to do. Um, and so one of the things is, you know, we, tell, we show them and we tell them that we appreciate what they do. Um, we have rules and we apply those rules appropriately uh, so that it's fair and equitable environment because people want to be treated fairly. Um, we give them the equipment that they need to do their job, the best that we can afford to buy, um, because that is motivating. Um, we try to hire the right people in the first place because that's hugely important. Um, we try to promote the, the right people because that's secondarily important. Uh, we talk about the importance of the work because that's crucial. Um, and then we monitor our personnel because sometimes, you know, we're human beings too. And, and everything that goes, um, sometimes things don't go as well. Um, and so we have to address that. But it's business and we keep it that way. And then we make time to, uh, where it's appropriate to have fun because this is a great environment that we work in. Uh, we're right now probably about four miles from the beach. Um, it's a beautiful day outside, and we try to keep that in perspective. Um, and all of the negativity that you hear in the environment, um, you know, we have to ask ourselves a question. Is it really that negative, or is that just the focus that when we turn on the television, that's what we're seeing? Because um, I was talking to, f to four young men who, ha who happened to visit me. Um, they live in the community. Um, they're, they're black. They came to see me uh, the other day because they wanted to get to know their police chief. So they called and made an appointment, and I talked to him. And one of them is uh, 21 years old, and he goes to Fisk University, and he was talking to me about the frustration he feels. He says, I want to join the movement. I want to do something important. I want to do all of these things. And I said, well, you, you, you do those things, and you find those, those movements that um, support your viewpoint. He says, what's the most important thing I can do? I said, one of the more important things you can do is turn off CNN. St stop, stop looking at all of that because it will have you believe that things are, are horrible. Are things perfect? Absolutely not. And I'm not going to stand here as a police chief or as a black American and tell you that they're perfect. What I'm going to say is it's not as bad everywhere as it is somewhere. Now you just have to know where you are in that mix. And then you have to get involved, but you have to get involved constructively. So it's not hard to stay positive. Um, sometimes there's challenges, and we just roll with it because that's what we do. Thank you. First, I wanted to say I'm really proud that you have achieved such an important position as a chief of the police, as a woman, I'm talking. The other thing is, every morning as a Baha'i, when I get up, I says, what can I do today to serve humanity? I know the aim of the police in general is to serve man I mean the community. But I have to be honest with you, I don't see that attitude from the police in all over the US. I have traveled extensively all over, and what I see on TV or, you know, in general, you know, it's not a kind of, you know, attitude of we are serving. Plus, we have to realize, you know, the reason I'm saying this, because I know you want to do something good, that you are planning to do some kind of training for the police department. Would you please remind them that, you know, it's very important that they have to be polite. You can't serve mankind or serve community if you are, you know, you have an attitude of ego and, you know, that kind of attitude. So, 
I had an uh, interaction with one police in Santa Monica, and I really admired him because I thought, my God, he, this was the police, and he was so kind and forgiving, and I thought that should be the kind of attitude we want, we expect from the police. So, I, so I'm sure already you, you have a good you know, influence on everybody. But I beg you in general, you know, I'm talking about just not Santa Monica, everywhere. The police has to change their attitude, and they have to be more kind. We are trying to serve all these communities. And if you are not kind, you can't do that. I'm sorry, I had to be honest. <laughs> no, no, no I, 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 I appreciate what you said, particularly since you said that your, your, your encounter with the Santa Monica police officer was a good one. Um, you know, because at a point, I start here, and then, you know, my influence to the degree that, that others um, listen to it, that's great. Um, but I'll say this, you know, it, it's, it's tragic that the perception of the police is, is so negative. Uh, it is tragic that um, we're, we're sometimes not appreciated at the level that we are, and it's tragic that sometimes we're our own worst enemies. Um, it's just it's tragic all the way around. Is there a solution? I don't know, but I can tell you that here we talk about the importance of you know the people that we serve. We don't shy away from the word service when we talk about uh, our obligations and responsibilities uh, in the public safety context. Uh, we have when people disagree with us, you know, we do sit down and listen and we talk about and try to work through those disagreements. Um, but again, you know, as I said earlier, disagreement doesn't mean di being disagreeable. Disagreement doesn't mean um, that you, you stop the, the dialogue if the dialogue needs to continue. But by the same token, we do have to recognize, you know, that we're an imperfect people doing an imperfect job under difficult circumstances. And, you know, we're human beings and sometimes, you know, um, we're crabby. Is that an excuse? Is that justified? No, not, not really. But it happens. And, and I can also make an argument. I've gone to my doctor, and my doctor's been crabby. Um, you know, and I'm, I, I've been concerned. It's like, well, excuse me, should I come back? Um, you know, so I think because we're on the, on the front lines, and so much is expected, when there is that disappointment, it is that much broader. Um, because I take the, the, the irritations not with some of the, the egregious things, not with, you know, the deaths that are just impossible to, to explain. Not, not that. I take the other things as, the things that are, are not quite there, as when people are, are mad at us, they're mad because their expectation of how we should be in some way, shape, or form wasn't met. And they're disappointed. And our obligation is to do better. And then there's those other things where we absolutely have to do better, and there's no question about it. I just wanted to add this also, that since I originally was from Washington, D.C., I remember at one time the government hired, you know, they reached to the Baha'is and they asked them, can you send us somebody to come and, you know, unite the government people, everybody, you know, so they can communicate, they can be more in unity, they work in unity, and I'm telling you it was very successful. So since I know this, I hope that the police department also do that to, you know, have trainings, because they have to learn what is our purpose here, why we have, you know, in order to have communication, they have to have a special trainings to learn how to communicate with the public. So well, there's a number of folks from the police department who are here today. Um, and the vast majority of them, in fact, I think all of them are supervisors and managers and or executives, uh, quite frankly. And one of the reasons for having them come in is to hear these kinds of things. So they can go back uh, to our personnel and talk about these things and talk about what they're hearing in the community and the kinds of things that are the, the basis of the conversations that we're having. And today is, is, is not unique either in the sense that what I'm hoping after, after we're all done is that we will um, have a few minutes to, to talk because one of the things that we're also doing is we're planning a series of community dialogues um, on, on, on race, equity, uh, the police, and um, we're going to be looking to community members, uh, and we've already identified who some of them are, to assist us with forming a, a a ser that series of dialogues, some of which will be youth-focused, others of which will be adult-focused, so we can start having these authentic conversations about race, dialogue, uh, where people are and what they feel about 
this police department. And I have to say that because while um, it is, there are challenges across the board with law enforcement, my ability to impact what's happening in the policing environment directly is limited here and indirectly spans a broader uh, level of, of connection with my colleague chiefs in the county, uh, my colleague chiefs in the state, and then those whom I interact with um, on a national basis. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I think we're in a, in a prime position to be able to push for, for those kinds of conversations. Yes. So this kind of echoes, I think, what the uh, last individual was mentioning, but it's the opposite. Um, the expectation from the community is obviously for the law enforcement to be held at a high standard. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the police community is seeing that from society. And so I say that because I think, you know, we have this expectation and we see things um, that are portrayed in media, but we don't see the good that the police community is doing. I live in, or I used to live in Pasadena, and I got involved, and I went through the Citizen Police Academy there to get to know the police community, right? So we have this expectation, but I don't know if we're really involved and know what the police force is doing until you really get involved and know the community, know the police officers and know the unit, and go on a ride-along. I've been on a ride-along, and it's not fun. I went on a Saturday morning thinking, it's going to be an easy one. And most of the calls were nothing but domestic abuse or domestic violence. And to kind of echo what you're saying, Chief, is that is what I saw from the officer. It was being a counselor, being someone of support, being someone of community service. To respond to all these calls, but at the same time, to give guidance to the individual that is being abused or the individual that is abusing. So I stand up here and I just want to thank everyone that is in law enforcement because there is good. I mean, um, the Pasadena Police community, I don't, I don't know if they do this anymore, but they um, were involved or they reached out to the Western Justice Center to do mediation for some of the, um, the, uh, the crimes that were taking place. So they do reach out and I kind of want to just, um, you know, vi voice the good that the community, the police officers do. Because I don't think we do see that. We see, you know, some of the blogs that go on and we do see the good. Um, I think just on media, um, news today I saw a snippet of an officer having tea with a, a child that he had saved. So it was a tea party. So those things, I think, shed light on the community. I'm not saying they, you know, there isn't anything good, like you were saying, Chief. There is good and bad in every one of us. I mean, I know I, don't, I have my bad days in my profession. I don't do it to my best. So I think, you know, that's the other thing is I don't know from your standpoint, <clears throat> excuse me, from your standpoint or from the police department standpoint what the community can do to help the officers as well and help the department that is here to, to serve and protect. Thank you. Um, and I'll just touch a little bit on, on what you said. I think, you know, there's, there's always this demand that the police department knows its community. And that's a rightful demand. But I always make the request equally, get to know your officers as well. Um, I'll tell a, a brief story um, that happened the other day. Normally people see me dressed like this because 98% of the time I'm dressed like this. So it's rather a surprise to people when I'm wearing normal people's clothes. Uh, and I happened to be somewhere and I was, it was a community event and I was wearing normal people's clothes. And people that normally would stand and speak to me walk right past me, like literally a couple of feet. And, my com and later I had the occasion to talk to one of the people who, who did that, who was kind of railing about, um, you know, what the police need to do. And I said, okay, well, that's fine, but let me make a suggestion to you. Because you just see me as a uniform, as evidenced by the fact that 22 minutes before now you walked past me Look, right, look me right in my face and didn't recognize that I'm Jacqueline Seabrooks. And Chief is great. You know, that's, that's fine. It comes with, you know, it's cachet. But sometimes, you know, we're, we're a little more than just a uniform. We're a little more than the people you call, you know, when, when it's horrifying. Um, and, and there is a need for that level of appreciation. Because it's, it's nice to get that, not because uh, police officers were killed in Dallas 
Police officers were killed in Baton Rouge. A captain was killed in Kansas City. Uh, two officers were shot two days ago in San Diego. There has to be that, that level of understanding and appreciation, too. Um, and I'm not saying that that needs to stand in lieu of you know, an, a need to make a changes in the profession. But there has to be some give and take. And I think too, for too long, perspectives about police have been zero sum. We have, you know, you either are, you know, some people will call, say you're a police apologist, uh, oh my gosh, or you hate the police and there's no in the middle. And the reality is the vast majority of the work that we do is work that is good, that resolves an issue, that does things that are for the benefit of a community, specifically and broadly. And there's a lot of really good work that goes uh, in the, in the um, community engagement piece and getting to know people and talking about the things that need to be talked about. But then we turn on television and we see our worst possible nightmares manifested and all of a sudden all the good work goes out of the window. And that shouldn't be the way that it is. Yes, sir. Yes. Chief Seabrooks, maybe we need to take two more questions, and should we do that? What is your time? How is your time? My time is your time. Okay, let's do this. But the other half of that, let me say, is we also will be retiring to a different area so that you can meet some of the men and women in the police department and they can take and answer questions too. Because while it's great that you're hearing from me, I also think you need to uh, engage with some of the staff from the police department on some of these important questions. Yes, friends, there is a follow-up to this and there will be table talks. So with that in mind, let's try to have two more questions, including this one, and then we continue. Thank you, Chief, for uh, coming and speaking with us today. My name is Timothy Conley. I am a professor, faculty member at Santa Monica College. Uh, my, uh, I was just sitting here thinking, I teach uh, media and film courses, but in the media courses, one of the courses I teach is media literacy. And we've actually, um, thanks to the state of California, been able to bring these classes out into the high schools, such as Santa Monica High, Venice High School, so on and so forth. But I'm just thinking about my young people, especially the, the teenagers. They're, unless you kind of put it in front of their face, they're not going to reach out and, 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 get, and engage. What are some of the things that the police are doing to really engage our youth? The, the older folks, they got to figure that out, obviously, but and work with you, and, and there's a traditional way of doing that. But what are some of the things that this police department, I, I know you don't speak for other police departments, but this police department is doing to really engage in this world where our young people, I have to really fight them to put down their phone for two seconds just to listen <laughs> to what I'm saying. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, we start young because we know that it's important. So we have a school resource officer program uh, that uh, puts officers uh, in contact with kids in the schools, in the elementary schools, the middle schools, and the high schools. Um, and we talk to them about the variety of, of, of issues and concerns of the day. Equally, we have you know, the D.A.R.E. program, which is tr a traditional program. We have the Youth Police Academy that isn't what you think it is. It's not the academy where you know, the kids are wanting to become explorers and the like. It's an opportunity for kids to visit the police department during the summer months and learn a little bit and, and see what happens. And we just had a class uh, graduate about a week and a half ago or so. Uh, we have programs like the Explorer Program and the Police Cadets and things like that for kids that are on the track uh, to, you know, maybe becoming a police officer but not. And then we have what we're, you know, we, we go to um, our Police Activities League. We have uh, a youth center in Virginia Park. Um, we collaborate with uh, the Pico Youth and Family Center so that we can reach those, those kids that aren't necessarily um, the mainstream kids because it's also important for them to have a relationship with the police as well and not just the relationship of, oh, you just did that, so now that's what we're talking to you, but differently. Because we understand, you know, one of the, the major, major adjustments is when, when people are familiar with us. You're not, you know, it always is a, a thorn in my side when I hear parents saying, oh, see, there's the police. If you do bad, they're going to come and take you to jail. I hate that. Because that's how you begin to inculcate with kids that they should be fearful of us. And you shouldn't be fearful. And I know that there are those who would say, well, look at what's happening A, B, and C. That notwithstanding, 
at the end of the day. Those are more the, the circumstances of what happens when you have no relationship as a police department with the community. There's not the mutual respect and all of those other things. So I want to put that in a separate category. And talking about and talk about the day-to-day -day interactions. We promote day-to-day -day interactions with kids, um, whether it's kids at PAL, at the Boys and Girls Club, and we use those opportunities to talk to kids in ways that are friendly. I always, you know, tell folks, you know, when they say, oh, I, I want to bring my kid by to see you, um, we take them on a tour of the jail. First thing I say is we don't, we don't do tours of the jail with kids. Kids should never see the inside of a jail. Adults should never see the inside of a jail unless they have done something that puts them there. So that answer is no, they can't go to the jail. Um, it was, you know, like I was, I was saying the other, about the, the four young men I was talking to the other day. One was eight. The t two of them were 17, they were twins, and the older brother was 21. They made an appointment to see their police chief and came down to see me. And on a Friday, I saw them, and we spent an hour and a half, almost two hours, talking about the state of things today. And those are some of the unique ways that we reach out to kids. And people in the organization have those kids in their circles that they touch. So it's not just the police chief. This is something that goes all the way down and through the organ throughout the organization because it's important. And then the other component of that is the conversations that I referenced. Uh, come the fall, we're going to be looking to uh, roll these conversations out. And when we originally started talking about them, we talked about them as conversations on race, equity, and procedural justice with adults. And then it hit me that, you know what, to your point, we have to do, talk about this with young kids, and we have to go where they're at. And that was why I was talking to these four young men, ranging in age from 8 to 21, because I want to know, where do you go? You live in Santa Monica. You guys have grown up here. What's your experience been? Tell me all about it. What are you thinking? You, you're, you're raised in a single-parent household. What, and and what, what really energized me is that none of them, notwithstanding the 8-year-old, because I wouldn't expect an 8-year-old to have an interaction with us other than dare, none of them had had a dealing with us. So I felt that was good. Um, so it, it struck me that we needed to do that. And every time I see young folks, uh, I try to make sure that there's a conversation because we need to break that cycle of telling our young people, uh, and we tell them when they're five or six, the police are like the boogeyman. And the reality is, no, we're not. We're the people you need to call when you need help. And in order to change that and, and do that kind of work, we have to take a different approach. And that's what we're doing with the young kids. And now that I know that you're doing media and film and media literacy over at SMC, I'm going to be talking to you too. <laughs> because I'm going to be looking for how we can make that connection so that we can reach more young people. And it doesn't, I'm, I'm not selfish about doing it just for the kids that are here in Santa Monica. I want to make sure that that's happening because it's a force multiplier. So the more the people that we can talk to, they'll go and tell 10 of their friends. Because I'm going to ask that you tell 10 of your friends about today. Okay, sir. Thanks, Chief, uh, for taking my question. My name is Nick, and I'm honored to be uh, here to listen to you. Uh, I watch CNN, but uh, my admiration for police department and law enforcement is just never ends. Uh, I want to shift gear and ask you a question about uh, glass ceiling. Uh, about your position uh, once we see the higher education institutions, women being violated day in, day out, or uh, CNN's uh, uh, Fox News uh, chief being resigned. How do you evaluate that, uh, that uh, glass ceiling? Uh, I think by now it should be steel ceiling uh, instead of... Well... Uh, it's, it's, a difficult a di it's a difficult question to answer, and I'll say this. When I became a police officer in 1981, I had no idea that I would be a police chief because I'd never seen a woman police chief. Um, and when I became a sergeant in 1990, I didn't know I could be a police chief because I'd never seen one as a woman. We didn't have any in the state at that time. Um, in 1996, when I was a police lieutenant, I had no idea that I could be a police chief because I'd never seen one. Well, I take it back, I'd seen one, but she was in Eunice, Louisiana, um, and I hadn't seen one. I'd heard there were increasingly more women becoming chiefs at that time, but in Santa Monica, in Los Angeles County, in agencies of this size, 
Um, and in no agency in the county of Los Angeles had I seen one. So there was a glass ceiling of sorts. Um, and then in 2000 and something, when I became a captain, I knew that there were women chiefs, but I didn't know whether or not I had what it took to do it. But people encouraged me and I applied and the rest, it didn't happen for me right away. There were some disappointments and probably well-placed disappointments. Um, and then at a point, not only was I the chief in England, now I'm the chief here, which I consider to be my professional home. So how do I look at the glass ceiling now? Well, I think that it's got a big crack in it, a real big crack for women in law enforcement. I can't speak to what they do at Fox, you know, what, what foolishness is happening, you know, like that. I, I, I think the opportunities for women now are, are um, I won't say evened out, but I'll say they're far better. And in this profession, because women have been in it and doing the array of jobs necessary to build the skill set to be able to move into administration, I have no doubt that um, it's much better than it's been in the past. Just, just in L.A. County alone, we have four women police chiefs. Um, up and down the state, uh, we have 26, I believe the number is now, and heading large police departments like San Diego um, and small ones, like the really small ones that you see when you go up to northern and central California. Now, when you look at that number, though, there's 343 um, municipal police chiefs in the state, so 26 of us are, are solar chiefs. That's not a lot, but that's a lot more than there was in 1981. So we're seeing the progress. Um, you know, women are now accepted. Um, the, the foolishness that occurred in the early years to ensure that there was a glass ceiling, I won't say that it's been eliminated, but it's been substantially dismantled. So the opportunities in public sector, in policing for women to uh, create their own destinies relative to work, it's there. A hundred percent? No. But nothing's a hundred percent. So, you know, people have to make their own choices. But for the woman who chooses to engage and do the things, the sky's the limit. Thank and you. sometimes it's not where you are. You have to go somewhere else to, to be that. Thank you. You're welcome. The person behind you. Uh-oh. Just one. Okay. 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 Now, I just got the, the hint. You are the last one, because then what we're going to do is, is retire to the other area, and these questions can be there. Oh, we have some music, some wonderful music, by the way. Yes. Hi, my name is Randy Walberger. I live in the community. Um, how do you feel about these uh, police cameras that are being used now? What, what do you think the future is uh, holds for them? Well, I actually like them, um, and I'll tell you why. Um, we have had uh, in-car cameras for quite a while now, um, and they have been very beneficial in assisting us. Uh, we're embarking on a pilot program for the body-worn cameras, and I like that idea as well. But I do want to say this about it. I think people sometimes believe that the, the, the cameras that officers wear become the, the curative or the, the, the cure-all for everything that could possibly go wrong, and it's going to shed light on everything. It's just another view, and it's, it's not a 3D view. Uh, it's a one-dimensional view. And it doesn't answer essential questions like what were officers thinking, what were they perceiving, what was going through their mind. It just sheds a light on something. But what I do like is that in addition to shedding a light on what uh, or a perspective on what may have occurred in an incident, it also sheds light on what occurs in other incidences, uh, incidences that, to the young lady's point, point out how wo the wonderful things that police officers do routinely. It also points out to people some of the things, the horrifying things that our citizenry does to police officers. Stuff that, you know, we don't go telling it. Um, you know, oh, that, that person said all this, this array of, of awful things or made false accusations or what have you. It will shed light on some of that. Um, this community is unique. Um, while not everybody is always happy with the police organization, and I understand that, there's not this, this disconnect between the police department and the community about the vast majority of things policing. So our in-car systems are being expanded with body-worn camera systems on a pilot so we can determine if this is a technology, a very costly technology that we want to invest in. Do we want to invest $10 million 
from here out every year or every few years with you know an, an ongoing cost that's pretty substantial for maintenance and the like, we're doing a pilot. It will tell us that. It will also shed some lights on the good things that we do, the areas where we can improve, the good things that our community does, and the areas where our, our community needs to improve. And I think that everybody is, is, is advanced by that because it will validate some things and, and shed light on other things and will also give us some, some things, as we spoke earlier about um, looking at what other agencies do to learn, it will also shed a light on some things that we may not see that we need to engage improvements on on our own. And something like that, you can't go wrong. You're welcome. So with all of that said, I thank you for your time, and I'll look forward to uh, interacting with you when we're in the back and we're, we have the chance to a answer more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. But don't get up. There's music coming. Okay, if you work for the Santa Monica Police Department, please stand up and get your get your accolades. So some of our friends close as well, so that was the recognition. Okay. Our friends have asked me to just uh, give this to you, present this to you as a token of our appreciation to you and Chief Seaworks, we are really grateful to you and such an honor for us that we had the opportunity to hear your thoughts, have you here with us, and members of your department as well. So we're totally and wholeheartedly grateful to you. At the onset of your presentation, you mentioned that something different and something better can start here. And it has already started. Uh, it has started on a great foundation, actually, that you yourself and your department has already established. So. Uh, with the interaction that you saw of people asking questions and sharing comments and being really frank and honest in that as well. You know the level of respect that the community has for you and for your department, whether you are in uniform, by the way, or not, right? So we respect you. We appreciate you. We are delighted that you were here and all of the members of your uh, department and we really appreciate you all. And please consider us as your supporters, your supporters, and your friends. This is where we are. This is what we want to do, and that is really why planning this event today was a kind of a long-time dream. This event was planned, and the, the subject of partnership actually was selected way before all of these uh, difficult, violent activities that we saw. So you know that we were really on the right wavelength anyway. So again, our wholehearted gratitude to you. Friends, we will have a couple of pieces of music so you can just kind of refill 